Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. It's a bumper Monday of professional cycling at World Tour level. Um, shook, there's no rest on the World Tour Rest Day because we have Benelux Tour, formerly Bink Bank Tour, formerly Enigo Tour, Binga Bongo Tour. It's one of the best races <laughs> to watch Bongo on the Tour. calendar. It's so exciting, um, the parkour usually, and today was no different. The Col- are uh, the main supporter, the show partner of the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. And I'm here with Benji, who's come back now that Vias are on action. Um, but Benji, this first stage, you've got the parkour here. It, it looks pancake flat. It looks like an obvious sprint. But where where is this in Belgium or the Netherlands? And like, what is the prevailing conditions in this region? All I see is like lowland water areas. Well, that's a very good question because uh... – I'm from Flanders, and I know a lot about Flanders, but when you start talking about the Friesland section of Netherlands, I don't have a clue where this is at. I just know that this is at the top, I think, of the Netherlands, <laughs> which is likely a region with a lot of wind because uh, it's uh, very northern in the Netherlands, and that's <laughs> a lot of information right there. It comes back to my region on the fourth stage, five kilometers from my home, so I will be uh, very happy to have that closer to home while I watch on the TV. So uh, that's pretty cool. Anyway, today's stage, like you said, pancake flat, but echelons in the region. And it was said for a week now that stuff is going to happen on this first stage. So everybody kind of knew it was going to happen, but we didn't see it because uh, the people who do the coverage apparently didn't know that it was going to happen because they decided to cover it very late. Every year. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) It's so sad because that's the most interesting part of this stage, really, how the echelons form. And we start the coverage with a breakaway of six, seven riders that are about to be caught by the first echelon. That includes the likes of an Evenepoel, a Sagan, a Tom Dumoulin, but also sprinters the likes of a Hodge, Gaviria, for example. Medellin was in that group. And yeah, stuff had already happened. There were people behind. There were some people behind that were important for GC. We'll try and take a look at who lost time today, perhaps after the stage, but uh, a solid gap in between, 1 minute 30, and it would become very dramatic when we saw Evenepoel standing by the side of the road without any real action happening beforehand, and we saw him complaining a lot at his front wheel and like ahead of his bike, so probably to a rider that caused something to him, and there was a wheel change necessary, and this was by far the longest wheel change I've seen in my life. <laughs> Neutral service car, so uh, basically the not the team car that is doing it for him. So that obviously says a lot. And one minute, 23 seconds is how I calculated it. But I did it based on uh, just looking at the time <laughs> stamps. Wait, on one the, minute, 20? One minute, 20 plus. Mate, don't you're going to reignite the disc for the rim brake debate all over again. Because obviously with a rim brake bike, you just pull the front wheel out and you hold it as they run to you with the front wheel and slot it in and there's compatibility so i've just started to debate myself um (laughs) (laughs) the thing there is like it's it started off with the dude in the car coming to remco with a back wheel and it's a front wheel that he needs to replace because (laughs) the spokes on his front wheel are basically out so he's coming there a back wheel he's got that little machine to take out the wheel and first of all it doesn't really work then he tries it from another angle then from another angle by the time he figures out how that thing works in that front wheel well it's already like 45 seconds past and at that point he has to run back to the car to get a front wheel instead of a back wheel (laughs) and yeah Remco's complaining and complaining because obviously it's not really uh supposed to be like this that it takes that long and if it takes 20 seconds he might be able to catch on but now he is uh, basically thrown into the second grew because of it and uh it's sad for remco's uh gc here certainly that he was aiming for but they uh were not waiting with too many rides i think Merku was waiting for him from the front group but three riders in the front group with hodge osgrin and so forth so if the koenig has osgrin at the front they're not gonna wait on them exactly. i would expect it's another it's a second gc threat here for benelux tour i mean other gc threats already uh out of a out of the picture already benji like dumoulin wasn't in g1 was he I thought maybe he could go okay here. He yep. was in good shape, Grant Thomas. Like, that's the beauty of this race. It's like UAE to a stage one or Parony stage two in 2020. I love it when the echelons just throw the GC. But is he out, out yet? Who? Everpool. No, no, he's still fine. He's still fine. I'm talking <laughs> I'm talking the guys who still haven't finished yet. 
Um, oh, okay. <laughs> like they were in G4 or whatever. Even if Paul, um, I don't think he knows that Asgren's their GC guy after today. I, I don't think so either. And I think they're probably going to take on Asgren as a defensive role from this point onwards and perhaps even to pull more an offensive solo rider to try and take time back on the rougher stages and yeah i don't see a even a pool riding for us in here unless it becomes absolutely necessary to take the victory with us anyway we'll move forward i think peter sagan also had an issue or crashed and he was similarly frustrated yeah. benji hasn't mentioned it already and we have the golden kilometer remind people benji what the what, go, golden kilometer is uh, it's an english word it's not supposed to be difficult for you <laughs> no it's g-o-u-d-e-n in flemish golden kilometer yeah okay it's hard for me as well because we say h instead of g when we see a g in west flemish because we're also pretty uh wrong in everything <laughs> but hey golden kilometer one kilometer with three uh, sprints in it one at zero meters in the kilometer 500 meters and then at the finish line as well well at the finish line i mean at the end of the one kilometer, so three and one kilometer. And uh, I think it's three to one in the seconds that the riders gain when passing every single one of those sprints. So you'd expect people to start attacking for those sprints. And we had people doing so. I think for the first uh, one, we had Berger making an initial move. I think he took the first one and Turnison came second on that one. So Turnison taking two points, uh, two seconds at least for GC. Kind of surprised that Berger is going for GC, probably because Sagan crashed as well, that he ended up playing in that role. But after that, we had the second one, the second uh, bonus sprint, and we had Turnison once again trying to get there, but Mohoric was sprinting to his wheel and actually kicked him over on the line, and not literally, but figuratively for the seconds, and Mohoric takes the three seconds, Turnison the two seconds, and the final sprint came, and that's where the best sprint of them all came. Colbrelli flies past <laughs> everybody with ultimate power, and then out of nowhere, God Sprinter, Tish Benoit, gets over him, and out sprints Colbrelli for the, for the intermediate Bruh. bonus seconds. <laughs> You know, Colbrelli, I don't think we touched on too much. You know, he had his team pretty much ride for him on every Tour de France flat front sprint stage, and he like, <laughs> I don't think he came top 10. Like, yeah, anyway, <laughs> we'll move on. I mean, Wait, it's he, not he even actually, done with Colbrelli. Oh, okay, sorry. I, I didn't At the end of the street, he rode to the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of blame Belgian race organizers. Yeah, that's Guys, kind of true. Uh, Driven Kurs and Brussels Cycling Classics, the arrows pointing everywhere, the roundabouts. But yeah, Paul Colbert. I mean, in his defense, he actually did a very nice job. I thought pacing yeah. for Morich. Morich going for GC, obviously, here in this group. Asgren as well, but they got Evan Paul behind. Oh, so quick step. Yeah, and then he had to switch. So it was like pacing to stop G2 coming yeah, and then true. the Bauhaus lead out. So double duties for him and Bauhaus obviously on magnificent form. Who else do we have quick in this group? Benji, Hodge, Gavidia, Gavidia. Hodge. Uh Some other people as well. <laughs> yes, indeed. And uh, I think Steven was doing a lead out for Peterson as well in this group. And Bobble was there. The rider that is supposed to be the lead out on paper for uh, Bennett Dennis. next season. Walshide was here, but although... Uh, I don't really count him as the fastest sprinter here as well, but also Tim Merlier, who has uh, arguably the fastest sprint of them all on a flat sprint based on the results of the last year and a half at least. So we're going into the sprint. It's yeah, pretty much the status quo. There's the Lucas Perselberger last kilometer, or last 1500 meter attack. We knew it was coming because he didn't have an Ackerman in the group nor a GC Sharkman in the group. So he's like, why not? Actually stays there, but he gets brought back. Um, he was so strong in the Dauphiné, Lucas Perschelberger. And I think G2, I mean, we still don't have time caps. Something weird is going on with the results, by the way, for this race. FYI, we sort of had to manually time it all. But yeah, leading out into the last 400 metres, Sturven, who probably will get picked for the Belgian World Champs team, missed timing for Mads Pedersen, who was on form, I think, in Denmark or the other day, into a Denmark, and he drops him off very, very early with Hodge on his wheel, further behind, fighting, I think, for Hodge's wheel, or fighting with Hodge's Bauhaus on the barriers on the left-hand side, and then Merlier is a bit further back. Pedersen, I was really surprised, Benji. I thought he was going to just jump early and trust his long sprint, which we've seen him do in the past, but he tries at like 300 to go back into the wheel, but he's still eating wind, and then they come over the top of him and he never really opens it up. I think, did he have any choice at that point? Do you think he should have just opened it up and hoped he was good enough? 
I think he should have opened it up and hoped he was good enough because that's his memo a bit. Uh, a few times we've seen him sprint quite a long time and always surprising that it's so long. So I was expecting a long sprint, but he didn't really do that. I was Hodge that game over first, really. And I was uh, I was scared of Hodge because he's been growing his form recently as well. But it seemed like he was falling short quite quickly as well. And there was one sprinter that flew past, right? Yeah, Tim Merlier, he's, I think, the only man who's really been able to go toe-to-toe with Caleb Ewan since, I mean, Bennett beat him in UAE too. Since after that, Giro beat Caleb Ewan. He won a Tour de France stage. He skipped the Vuelta. He now wins the first stage of the Benelux Tour. He's looking in fantastic form. And to be honest, it was not close. He had Bauhaus in his wheel. He had other sprinters in his wheel. And they were flat out just trying to stay in that wheel and couldn't come over them. Yes, I don't want to speak about ad nauseum. He moves to the right at the end. Is it intentional? I don't know. Is it unnecessary? If it is intentional, of course, he was winning anyway. And does it endanger Bauhaus? Subjective, whatever. Benji already tweeted about it. If you want to read his thoughts there. But... The question I have, Benji, is he's beating, beating Bauhaus, beating Gaviria, which, to be honest, I expect him to do. Pedersen a little bit underwhelming. Is this is Molier on the team sheet for the Belgian World Championships, and can he survive that parkour? It's a really difficult question because you got to look at it from the aspect of the national coach right now who has a lot of riders he can select from. You've got... First of all, Vanat, who is said to be the lonely leader for the race based on all the rumors we've had so far. If that is the case, then what is the problem with having Merlier? Well, he's a sprinter and he's likely not going to be overly happy that he has to ride for people despite being an ex-teammate for Vanat. So that's perhaps the light in, at the end of the tunnel where he might be willing to ride himself away for Vanat. But I'm being attacked by a fly, okay. Anyway, um, we had Vanat as written down leader even the pool's been winning a lot of stuff on smaller competitions people are starting to look at him as well as a co-leader because well it's quite simple if he starts winning solo right now he might be able to put fanat in a seat by attacking on on the world exactly. championships and do stuff like that merlier the problem with him is that it's kind of the same equation as phillips and do you take another extra sprinter next to that i think that merlier might be doable to survive this parkour, but it's going to be a relatively close one. I think I mentioned on one of the podcasts recently that we have two races, the GP Jeff Skerens Leuven uh, and the Driven Kurs Overreste. If you match those two together, you've got the World Championships parkour. And I think on both of them, he survived relatively well, but I'm not exactly 100% sure. So I might have to look back at that in a bit. I think he didn't ride Driven Kurs, but he did survive Jeff Skerens Leuven. Now, a driving course is the hardest one of the two. So uh, ah, it's a close one if Marnier survives the parkour. And if you have such a close fight, then you might as well put everything in the basket of Outfinard and not have him selected in my eyes. But feels bad, man. Who's the fastest sprinter in a bunch? Marnier. Who would you take? you take Merlier? Yeah. I agree. I agree with you. I think he's he's been very good. <laughs> he's been the results don't lie this year. I mean, uh, let me have Top five sprinter. I think top five is even being very conservative. Uh, this year he's won Le Semin, Grand Prix Jean-Pierre Montserrat, Prudent, <laughs> You're Doxy, starting the with the lowest names. <laughs> Mate, they're the biggest wins for Alperson. <laughs> the Belgian won once. Le, no, it's Le Semin's actually a good race. Um, Giro stage two, Ronde van Limburg, Elstead and Ronde. Elstead and Ronde actually have good – that was good competition yeah, there. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, Tour de France stage three, and now Benelux Tour stage one. Um, We're joking with these smaller races, but this is how Alpecin consistently keeps their first spot in the Pro Continental ranking, allowing them to select their own races because they're the first in that ranking. So uh, it's genius that they sent Merlier to those races to just rack up the points left and right, you know? Well, like Elstein Ronda had Cavendish, Ackerman, Cavendish being led up by Murku, by the way. Hey, story time. And I wrote the sportive of this race. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, Three years Bruges. ago. I died, but <laughs> I did it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's interesting seeing Benelux Tour here now with the riders, a lot of them favorites for the World Championships coming up on a similar, you know, a classic style racing. 
The big news, I should do the top 10. Mervia first, Bauhaus second, Hodge third, Gaviria fourth, Colombian teammates at UAE next year. Can't wait to see that with Milano and Ackerman. Pedersen fifth, a little bit disappointing, but the lead out wasn't perfect. Van Poppel sixth, Valshide seventh, Anjol Kolsky eighth, and Mike Turnison ninth. We don't actually have a full top 10 um, or GC. It's not been released yet, so you'll have to just wait for that. But Ram Avenapol's lost, I think, a minute, a little bit over a minute, maybe 55 seconds. minute to two minutes, roughly in between there, I think. The big news of this race, uh, before we talk about the TT tomorrow, is after the race, Evenepoel goes straight over to Alperson, all the cameras on him, and he starts shouting at, Al- at Yanni Vermeersh, the 29-year-old on Alperson Phoenix, and Benji did some trans... Was it in English or Dutch? Benji. It was in Dutch, uh, well, semi-Flemish Dutch that he was shouting at Vermeers because they're obviously both Flemish riders. Now, so Remco started shouting and it's kind of started in the middle of the conversation. So I, I don't know if I've got everything of the conversation that they were shouting at each other, but basically the gist of it was, we're just riding normally next to each other and you just come diagonally into me. No need to just run away while I'm talking to you. You should realize your mistake. <laughs> and I think he added, are you laughing at me now? Come on, dude. Something like that at the end of the at the end of the uh the conversation and i like we don't know what happened we don't have any footage of it we just know that the spokes of his front wheel are broken and that they're complaining against each other well remco against Vermeersch. now what this reminded me of was Vermeersch's history and i think it was the giro where sabatini was complaining against him on one of the stages then von emden on one of the other stages and i think uh i remember something vague in 2015 as well where Merle was uh, actually complaining against Vermeer about something. So I think that there's becoming a bit of a habit here. <laughs> and it seems like he's always kind of riding away or running away at the moment when people start complaining against him after the race. Now, I don't know if he's at fault here, so let that be clear. And I don't know whether it's just Remco being very sensitive because we know he uh, is a bit like that. But uh, hey, that's what we love about cycling, the drama. I think it was great. I love to see it. I love to see people going <laughs> at each other after the race. It's definitely, that's usually like, there's a difference between, you know, shouting at someone like that and what are you doing? You chop my front wheel, that's fine. Uh, putting hands on each other like Marcel and Kwiatkowski, I think, didn't like that particularly. Wheel hitting like Rui Costa and Barido <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> We've seen a lot, spike. people are going to go crazy. I think the sports are in Vila's comments are popping off right now on all the articles about this. But, yeah, it's certainly no Cipollini knocking a guy out the next morning <laughs> before the Vuelta stage. There's definitely a lot of space between them. Whether who's in the right or the wrong, we won't really know. It, you know, it could have just been normal riding in Vias where you – you know, guys are moving their back wheel all the time, are reacting to things, and someone moves at the front, and then there's a concertina effect, and then they move a bit more at the back, and you got to protect your front wheel, and you know, it, maybe it's just that, or maybe it was a dodgy move. We don't know. That's the drama of it. I'm expecting even a pole to mount. Uh, he's going to go on a long range of Benji. There's, he's going to have a rage fueled long ranger. Um, yeah, but. Let's talk about before how much time he might be behind, particularly because tomorrow we've got an 11K TT flat as a pancake. Does he beat Askren on that? On a short time trial? Ooh, it's going to be a close one. I think he might. I would dare to say he might on the short one. On the longer one, I'd say that it's going to be closer. But then again, they're both pretty good at close longer ones as well. So I don't know, man. We'll see tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> We also have Bissega here, who should be a very, Ooh. very good shout for tomorrow's TT to win this. Is Kung here? Yes, Jeff and Kung oh. is here as well. He missed the split. Dumoulin's here. McNulty, Thomas, Campanars, Cranderson, Affini, Björk, Sobrero. This is outrageous. <laughs> Mate, imagine Love if it. any of these were at the Vuelta for the prologue. <laughs> <laughs> It's so insane, right? Like, I'm going to go for an outsider. I'm going to say that we'll see a top 10 from a Sport Vlaanderen Balwaza rider, Rune Gerrigots. He was fourth at the Balwaza Belgium Tour ITT, also 11.2 kilometers. He did that ahead of semi decent time trialists, but just behind Finn Fisher Black and 20 seconds behind David Apple and Lampard. So I can feel it. Young guy coming up, and he's, uh, he's looking good. He won Paris Tour U23 ahead of Jordi Maus uh, last year and 
he's got a contract with Sport Vlander and Balois the next year, and uh, he will be on quick step <laughs> in two years. I'll bet you. A lot of Sudal. A lot of Sudal. Uh, nah, I reckon quick step. He looks like the Balois a quick step <laughs> transition to me at 24 okay. or 25. Anyway, it should be a good TT tomorrow. It's literally one of the most stacked TT fields we have this year. And, uh, and then we have another three, four, five, six, seven, stage seven finishes on uh, Gerardsberg, and that's always a great stage. So the Benelux Tour has started well, and I think it's going to keep staying exciting, Benji. But, yeah, any last thoughts on the stage today? Have you seen anything else in the Belgian media to change our opinion on anything? Well, no, because I've been on the podcast since the stage ended, so it's pretty difficult for me to have seen anything. But uh, I'll be back for the Vuelta as well tomorrow. Uh, the memo was a lie at the start of that. <laughs> at the start of that video, I just want to want to say that I love you guys, so I would never disappear for a reason like that. <laughs> I don't believe a word of it. Okay. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the recap of the Benelux Tour. But that's all from us today. Give us a like down below if you're watching on YouTube or on podcast players. Give us a review on your podcast player of choice. If it's Apple, make sure to give us a rating as well. And we'll see you with the Vuelta Stage 16 coverage tomorrow. Ciao.